Welcome to Disneyland Paris. Here are thrilling roller coasters, dozens of Disney characters, spectacular shows, and a fairy tale castle bring in millions of visitors a year. It's a place where even grown-ups believe in magic. Basically, we're in the magic business, and you're not supposed to see the trickery or how it's done. The Disney people have always kept the tricks of their trade a closely guarded secret. But now, for the first time, they've allowed cameras behind the scenes for a look at what it takes to make the magic come alive. Join us for Inside Disneyland Paris. Whether you travel by train or rent a car, the Magic Kingdom is easy to reach. Just 20 miles east of the great European city of Paris, it's a theme park where 12 and a half million people go each year for thrills, family fun, and that unique brand of Disney magic. What started with a mouse and became a multi-billion dollar company has produced this new pleasure zone in the global Disney empire. You probably already know about Disneyland in California and Walt Disney World in Florida. But you may not be familiar with Disney's latest extravaganza, Disneyland Paris. The whole place is like a giant movie set where stories are made real, thanks to Imagineers, people who mix imagination and engineering. Entering the park is like going to see a movie. When you enter the auditorium, then it's dark, and then the movie begins, and you see the light on the silver screen. When you enter the park here, you don't see the park itself. You have to go under the uh, station, and then you discover the rest of the park. And it's like you're on the set now. You're no more watching a movie. You're in the movie. Just as a movie has different scenes, the park here has five different sets which you can sample by steam train. On leaving Main Street, you reach Frontierland and the familiar scenes of the Wild West. Or you can choose the futuristic rides of Discoveryland or enjoy the fairy tale world of Fantasyland. But let's begin our visit in Adventureland, where, like Indiana Jones, you brave the perils of the jungle. The archeologists have fled the gods are angry. Their revenge will be terrible. There's trouble ahead. This ride will have you begging for less time after time. One minute 45 of thrills that feel like a lifetime when you're on it. Indiana Jones, the Temple of Peril, was already one of the most popular rides in the park. But recently, the roller coaster buried deep in the heart of Adventureland has had a major revamp. It's amazing. It's very nice <laughs> and exciting, very exciting. Oh, I don't like it. It, it. You do a hoop to hoop backwards. Absolute nightmare. The idea of getting passengers to do the whole ride backwards happened almost by accident. It sounds simple enough, but the consequences have been huge. We persuaded one of the creative team who worked on the redesign of the ride to tell us how it happened. The Temple of Peril originally opened in 1993. It was a victim of its own success to a certain extent because it became one of the most popular attractions. And so after a couple of years, we began to look at the attraction in the same way an artist looks at his, his painting after a couple of years and says, what could I do to embellish that or what could I do to improve that? At very busy times, the wait in the line for the ride was up to two hours long. So the first job was to redesign the carriages to fit in more passengers, six, not four, but at the same time make them lighter so that the ride would be more efficient. It was mission impossible for the engineers. An absolute nightmare. How do you 
put 50% more people into a train which we know is already on the limit of its weight. We're actually automatically putting more people in and they want us to take weight away from the, uh, from the train as well. An absolute nightmare. The solution was to strip off all the excess decoration and weight inside the carriages and to cram the seats together in a more upright position. Then came the suggestion, why not turn the seats around backwards? We actually strapped an 8mm camera to the back of the existing ride vehicles and filmed the attraction backwards. We could then see what the guests were going to see. It was a great idea. The ride would be thrilling. But it gave Andrew a new challenge to work on too many lateral G's. Lateral G's are what physicists call the effect of being thrown from one side to the other on a ride. Visitors call the same thing fun, but the key is to have them in moderation. It's a white knuckle ride, they're gripping this uh, hand rest like nobody's business. You're going forwards and they anticipate a fraction of a second before they go into the bend, which way they're going to brace their body. When you're going backwards, you don't know which way you're going to go. So obviously your head is constantly being rolled from one side to the other. For us, that's a problem. The answer wasn't hard to find. The engineers got down to work on the track itself and started making changes. As you can see here, this part of the track was modified. We've banked it more to prevent the body being thrown too far out as they go into the bend. There's other areas further down in which we have tweaked it in a different manner, but the whole idea is we don't want a smooth run. It needs to be a slightly shaky ride, but we don't want to have excessive lateral Gs. The engineers had cracked it. Now the designers had some thinking to do. If you were in a, in a movie theater, you'd be watching the screen. If you turned around behind you, you'd be looking straight into the projection room, which is obviously not something you really want to see. So in the same sense, in our attractions, we have ride vehicles that have our guests facing in a certain direction, so we're guiding what they're seeing. However, if the guests turn around and look behind them, then they're obviously going to see something that we don't wish them to see. And that was one of the, the major challenges, was trying to find a way of hiding and theming all these different lighting rigs, things that the guests shouldn't really see. I think a lot of people find Indiana Jones the Temple of Peril backwards even more thrilling than when it went forwards. It's actually like a real Indiana Jones adventure. There's a surprise around every bend. You don't know when the drops are coming. You certainly don't, when the, don't know when the loop is coming. Um, and I think that makes for an even more thrilling attraction. In the end, they found answers to every problem. The only thing is, it's now more popular than ever, and you still have to wait to get on. So here's a tip. The new fast pass system lets you punch your ticket and then gives you a time to come back later. And when you do, you can go straight to the front of the line and have the ride of your life. The movie set magic carries on outside the park. There are seven hotels to stay at, each with a different theme. At the Cheyenne, you're in cowboy country with buildings inspired by Hollywood westerns. At the Santa Fe, you can almost feel the hot desert winds blowing through the Mexican-style pueblos. There's urban chic at the New York, and at the Newport Bay, the nautical decorations of a New England-style sailing club. The Newport Bay is the biggest of all the hotels, with 1,100 rooms. In fact, it's the biggest hotel in Europe and can have 3,000 guests a night. Your room is in the east wing on the fifth floor, room number 305. Can I stay, sir? Thank you. You're welcome. The hotel is a half a mile from one end of it to the other. That's a lot of corridor to carpet and clean, and a long walk back for any guest who's left something in the lobby, as Andre Willie knows only too well. He's a real Disneyland fan. In fact, he's been to the park so often he's lost count. We've been coming here well, since it first opened in, in 1992, and we've come pretty much every year since. I mean, this year I've been three times already this year, um, and it's, you know, it's just such a lovely place to come to. It's so peaceful and relaxed. You can get away from it all, or you can go and have the pearly burly of the rides, whichever you want. He was so impressed after his first visit to a Disney theme park that he got a part-time job at one of their stores, and he still can't get enough. You're right in the heart of it, nothing intrudes, there's no real world anymore, um, and you can just completely escape um, and, and just have a wonderful time. 
It's the detail that makes the Disney magic that kids of all ages enjoy. Stay with us to find out how they make real movie magic and how Disney can send you to the moon. Stepping into this part of Disneyland Paris takes you into the world of the future. Only this is no techno zone. This is the future as imagined by great European writers and explorers more than a hundred years ago. Among them, a world famous French novelist who wrote one of the earliest space adventures. Jules Verne is considered the father of science fiction. And it was a story he wrote in the 1800s about being fired out of a cannon from the earth to the moon that inspired the most popular attraction in Discoveryland. Space Mountain is the park's newest, biggest, and most expensive roller coaster. But this is a ride with a twist, several of them, plus a corkscrew and a total loop, all of which you do in the dark, because this is a journey from Earth into space. We read the novel again and again, and, and so uh, this wonderful story with a cannon, with a, with a kaboom. We decided that we would create that cannon for Disneyland Paris too. The man who spent two years of his life making that human cannon a reality is Mike Kent. It was a challenge. <laughs> um, it was a big challenge because there were lots of things on this attraction that had, that had never really been attempted before. For a start, shooting people out of a cannon uphill. And then doing that every 30 seconds or so. That's unique. When you get fired to the moon on Space Mountain, you go from zero to 60 in two and a half seconds. But one of the secrets of the ride's success is in slowing people down. At the top of the catapult, there's, a, there's a, a few seconds of weightlessness as you go over the top of the catapult, which, which simulates the, the moonshot of, of the cannon. And if you get the speed wrong at the top of the catapult, you don't, you don't get that, that feel of weightlessness. Changing the speed of the cars and how far apart they are on the ride is the key to safety also. It's so complex, it's all controlled by computer. Well, five computers, in fact. During the three seconds of launch, there are five computers that run in synchronization to guarantee the safety of the launch. And I believe that's the same number that checked the launch for a space shuttle. So for the three seconds that the train is in flight on the catapult, it's analogous to a space shuttle launch. In a locked room is the roller coaster's nerve center, which TV cameras have never been allowed into before now. If you look at the, the size of the, the wiring loom here, you get an idea for how complex the whole thing really is. Each of these wires is attached to a sensor on the track, feeding back information to the computers, which check and cross-check for any glitches. Another thing that visitors don't get to see is the music. It's like movie music. You don't notice it at first, but you'd sure miss it if it wasn't there. It was specially written for the ride by one of Steven Spielberg's favorite composers, and the way you get to hear it is totally unique. Mike allowed us exclusive access to one of the maintenance rooms to explain how the onboard sound system works. Each part of the ride has its own audio track, its own theme. The vehicle itself knows exactly where it is in the ride and it chooses the music to play for that portion of the ride and all the musical um, elements are stored within this this box here and they're stored as um, a digital data on, on what's called a flash card and the system as it moves through the ride steps from flash card to flash card playing the music and the way you get to hear it is a surprise too the six speakers delivering cd quality sound Underneath the seats, there's a bass bin that gives you the warmth from the music. Either side of you, there are these mid-range units, and then up in the headrest, there are tweeters, which give you the real high-frequency buzz from the music. And this was the first time that, that anybody had put this type of technology into a roller coaster. Uh, you know, the, the, the guys that did this literally wrote the book as they were doing it. It's such a wow, even world-famous astronauts have given it the thumbs up. 
Buzz Aldrin was there to try the traction and it said it was nearly as impressive as the first time for him. So we knew we had been successful in creating this attraction because even Buzz Aldrin told us that it was really very, very good. Right next door to Space Mountain is a brand new attraction. Honey, I Shrunk the Audience takes a familiar idea and gives it a 21st century twist. This isn't just a movie, it's an experience you see, hear, and feel. Absolutely fantastic. Best thing in the whole park, I would say. Really Excellent. good. Excellent. Excellent. Very, very good. It's amazing. Yes, it's like a dream. <laughs> People arriving at the attraction are told they'll be part of an award ceremony for crazy inventor Wayne Zielinski. But as with all the Honey movies, things don't go to plan. The professor's incredible shrinking machine gets turned on you, the audience. And so with the help of some Disney magic, you shrink. When, when I actually shrunk the orange, you wonder where you're going, it all sort of sinks down. And the brilliant. dog at the end with the sneeze, and it all soaks <laughs> in. It's brilliant, it's I brilliant, recommend yeah. it. To create this experience was a massive construction job. Three shifts worked 24 hours a day to dig out the pit. Above it was suspended a moving floor that in itself weighed 100 tons. Add another 50 tons when you have 600 people sitting down, and you have a major engineering feat. But that's just the start of the special effects. It's perfect for those who long for the new companionship of a pet. None of the associated mess or mice get more power. Too much, too much. A special camera was used to create the visuals. Plus a mass of lasers and fiber optics. In fact, the whole theater is packed full of hidden special effects. 30 miles of electric cables were installed, plus three miles of air pipes and a mass of water pipes. All hidden from the public to create not just a visual, but a multi-sensory experience. The audience is a very important part of this because uh, any time you get 600 people gathered together and experiencing the same event, uh, simultaneously, there is a reaction, and the award ceremony has amazing effects on this audience. This uh, dimensional duplicator was developed right here. <laughs> so now all we need is something to duplicate. Commencing copy ball. What? Oh, it off. I don't know how. Turn it off. What do you mean you don't know how? I've only seen you do it and work it. They only showed me how to turn it off. Very real, very, very scary sometimes for a little one. Yeah, well, the uh, the mice was good. Oh, oh, it's disgusting. When the mouse uh, went up and down my legs, that was very scary. My snake, I, I think he might be over there. Can you find him for me? Oh. The tricks that we use to get the audience totally wrapped up in the experience um, are surprises and uh, part of our wonderful, mysterious technology. Um, look, just stay in your seats, ladies and gentlemen, and we'll blow you up as soon as possible. Then you can see how Disney does big and go where cameras have never been before, behind the scenes at the Disney Parade. It's mid-afternoon in Disneyland Paris, and there's a growing sense of excitement Long before the spectacle begins, families line the street to get the best view. It's the Disney Parade. With floats 30 feet high. All the favorite Disney characters and a troupe of colorful dancers. It's a major production. It's called the Imagination's Parade because the idea is to represent all the nations of the world for the new millennium. Each continent has its own float surrounded by dancers from nearby countries. One of the most important people behind the scenes is costume designer Sue Lacache. 
It's her job to dream up outlandish outfits for the imagination's parade, using the talents of her costume makers and a wealth of wonderful fabrics. She spent years designing costumes for major stage productions and films, and won an Emmy for one of the movies she worked on. But creating outfits for a daily show outdoors has brought her surprising challenges. Believe it or not, even in the sun, the fabrics fade very, very fast, much quicker than you'd ever imagine. All the costumes are cleaned every single day, and uh, we really do have to choose our fabrics and our materials very, very carefully. The practical problems aside, it's not easy making costumes that turn people into continents. It needs a lot of imagination. Take uh, Canada, for example. How would you represent it? I couldn't at first think of something, and then in the end I thought, oh, why not a snowball? And I think they really enjoy wearing them, actually. There's the Chinese girl. The skirt, I thought of a Chinese lantern. I used a nylon fabric over a wire frame, and then we painted in a traditional Chinese design. Everyone enjoys the parade, but the hours of preparation beforehand have always been kept secret until now. Disney is so sensitive about the magic it makes in this building that even the staff aren't allowed to bring in their cameras. Now, we can reveal the backstage process for the first time. Dozens of dancers gather here to start putting on their makeup and costumes. Then, they're transformed into the fantasy creatures of the Imagination's Parade. Miss Asia leads the procession and so gets made up first. It takes nearly an hour to get ready and the parade lasts 20 to 25 minutes. You do wonder, all this for just 20 minutes, is it worth it? It's the huge investment in time and effort that makes it work. 